mentioning the marriage builder takes, takes my memory back a little bit. We have been married 50 years, as I said last night, but after about eight years of marriage, um, we hit a real rough spot in our marriage. Not that we didn't have rough spots before or since, but it was really a rough spot where we were sitting together one evening. Our two boys were, I don't know, about two and four, I suppose, and we admitted to each other that we had lost any real desire to be together. And here I was, a marriage counselor, <laughs> thinking, all right, what the dickens do I do now? Um, so I decided to really think about it, and that's what led to the book, The Marriage Builder. It was my effort to rebuild my marriage. It was my effort to think through, what does it mean to not live in a marriage with a demanding spirit? What does it mean to not live in a marriage with a requirement that the other brings you what only God can give you? And um, that, was a, that was a hard lesson for me to learn. When we did get married 50 years ago, we said all the right words, I promise to love, honor, cherish, do all sorts of wonderful things until I die. Um, something like that, you know. Um, but I believe looking back on that day when we married 50 years ago that I was saying something very differently in my soul. Proverbs 20 and verse 5 says that the, the purposes of a man's heart are like deep waters, meaning you really don't recognize what your core motivation is. And I believe when I stood before the preacher, the pastor, and said my vows to Rachel and she said her vows to me, that I think something was going on in our souls that neither of us were aware of. As a kid, I had two major problems that I'm willing to share, some others that I'm not willing to share. <laughs> But the two problems that were quite visible, um, number one, I had a whole lot of pimples, a lot of skin problems. And number two, I was a bad stutterer. Um, my worst letters as a stutterer were L and P. My name is Larry, and I was raised in Plymouth Meeting, Pennsylvania, <laughs> raised among the Plymouth Brethren. When Dad wanted to buy a Plymouth, I said, get a Ford, I can pronounce it. <laughs> my first time I ever prayed publicly, I was raised in a small church where when boys turned 15, they were expected to take part in a little communion service. So one Sunday morning, under the leading of the pressure of the saints, I arose. And I prayed the most heretical prayer in the history of the church, I think. I was so nervous, I was stuttering. I had Jesus in heaven watching the Father on the cross, and the Spirit was in the grave. It wasn't a good sermon. Um, I was so nervous about stuttering that I finally heard the Spirit say, say amen. I could say that as I said it and sat down. And um, I was very embarrassed, full of shame. And yet, but, but I met this really pretty girl when I was 10, like I mentioned last night, and had our first date at 12, and then dated off and on until we got married. And here was a really nice, young, pretty girl that didn't seem to mind the fact that my skin wasn't all that attractive, and that I stuttered and made a fool of myself sometimes. And so I married her, I believe, in my soul, saying different words than I said out loud. I think what I was saying to Rachel was, listen here, lady. I like the way you make me feel. Keep it up. <laughs> and Rachel, as I don't recall if I mentioned last night, was sexually abused from ages 8 to 12. That's not something I, I'm, I'm saying out of school because she speaks very publicly about that. But I believe that after the sexual abuse that she endured for four years as a young girl, 8 to 12, that when I got into her life, and as a Christian young man, I didn't force myself on her. We didn't have sex until we got married. And I think she felt over the years of our courtship, if you will, that here was a guy that seemed to value me for more than my body. And I believe what she was saying when she made all of her wonderful vows, repeating after the preacher, I think she was saying, I like the way you treat me. I like the way you make me feel. I don't feel just like a body. I feel like there might be something about me that you desire, and I want to feel that way for the rest of our marriage. You got that straight? <laughs> you see, I believe our marriage began like most of your marriages began. I like to call it a tick on a dog relationship. <laughs> it takes a bit of the romance out of it, I suppose, but <laughs> um, you know what a tick is. It's a little critter that finds something that goes into your flesh, whatever, and sinks its teeth if it has it into your flesh and yanks out whatever will feed itself. Well, the problem in most marriages, after years of marriage counseling, I've concluded this very erudite strategic thought, that the problem with most marriages is there's two ticks and no dog. Think about that. 
So what does it mean to, to love? What does it mean to demand nothing from the other and to give everything for the pleasure of the Father and the well-being of the other? What does that mean? What does it mean to, what does it mean to love? Well, let me tell you that um, when I left last night, I felt disorganized and confused, primarily because of one question that came from over here during our brief question and answer time. So what am I supposed to say to the younger generation now that I'm part of the older generation? What am I supposed to say to the younger generation? And I got up this morning, not as early as I expected to, I actually slept pretty well, but I got up this morning and I wrote down a couple of scribbled notes here that I want to share as I get underway this morning. And I want to tell you what went through my head that I didn't say last night in response to the question of what I would say to the, to the younger generation. I think one thing, there's so many things, of course, that could be said, but one thing that occurred to me this morning that I maybe had in my mind a little bit last night, but got a little clearer this morning, think hard, and that, this is not just for the younger generation, this is for all of us as believers, but I would urge each of us, me very much included, think hard about what it means to, to walk the narrow road. Matthew 7, 13 and 14, the Lord at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, almost at quite at the end, He said, I want you all to understand something, that there's a broad road that most everybody takes and walks. But if you walk on the narrow road, if you travel through life on the, on the broad road, rather, you're going to end up wasting your life. But if you walk on the narrow road, which not many find, and I would suggest that those who do find sometimes get off it rather easily, Walk on the narrow road because the narrow road leads to life, and that just leads to two very obvious questions. What makes the road of following Jesus narrow? What is narrow about this narrow road of discipleship, of spiritual formation? And that's the first question. The second question, what is the life that walking that, nar that narrow road is going to lead to? I just want to ramble about this for a few moments before I get into what I had planned to say this morning. Um, One of my favorite quotes from C.S. Lewis, and when I have a good quote and have no idea who said it, I give it to Lewis, I figure he probably did. <laughs> But this quote did come from C.S. Lewis, as I recall. He said this, he said, put first things first, and second things are thrown in. Put second things first, and you lose both first and second things. The word narrow in the text in Matthew 7 is a word that literally has the idea of squeezing something out of you. Is it possible that our natural commitment from the time we were conceived until even now, continually, our natural commitment is to put second things first, meaning to look at all the things in life that can give us the feelings that we want and the success that we want and the enjoyment that we want, all the second things such as um, hoping my books sell. That's got to be a second thing. Hoping I get a good report from my oncologist, that's got to be a second thing. The narrow road is a road that squeezes second things out of us so first things can take their place. And the question is, what's the first thing? And what is the life to which it leads? There's a, one of the more interesting of the Puritans was a man named Thomas Chalmers, and he had a wonderful phrase for which he's pretty well known. He talked about the expulsive power of a new affection. If there's something in my soul that becomes aware of my thirst to know God and to love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, that becomes an expulsive power. It's an affection that I have for God that squeezes out my commitment to second things until finally first things more easily, more often, more clearly assume first place priority in my life, and I become a first thing Christian. It's the narrow road that turns you into a first thing Christian because the difficulties of life, the suffering of life, squeeze out of you all that is getting in the way of your radical commitment to the Lord and to live like Him and to be formed like Him. I'm very struck with what Paul said when he was um, in the, the book of Philippians, living under house arrest, and he said something that um, has just hit me very hard over the years. He said, I want you to understand, and remember, Paul is sitting in prison. If I were sitting in prison unjustly, Paul was sitting in prison unjustly. He was there for preaching Jesus. If I were sitting in prison unjustly, I think my first thing would be, I want a good lawyer. I think my first thing would be, find some way to get me out of prison because I want a second thing life. I want to get out of this prison and go have dinner with some friends, and I want to go to a conference at Zenos Institute, and I want to have a good time, and I want to go on a, a vacation with my wife to celebrate our 50th. All those things are wonderful things to enjoy, wonderful things to do. Make them your first thing, and you're an idolater. 
So Paul said, as he's sitting in prison, he says in verse 10 of Philippians 1, I said, he said, I want you to understand what really matters. I want you to know what really matters. And then he goes on to say, what really matters is that you bear the fruit of righteousness that comes from knowing Jesus. I want you to understand that. Paul wanted us to, to, to understand that there, there's a first thing that has to do with knowing Jesus and relating like Jesus and putting him on display by the way you relate. And then in 2 Timothy, now Paul is no longer under house arrest. He's in a dungeon, a very hard to find dungeon in Rome, a very difficult place, and he's awaiting execution. And he's awaiting execution for preaching Jesus. And toward the end of 2 Timothy, as he's talking to the, his young son of the faith, Timothy, he said, I've, I've fought the good fight. I wonder if I could say that when my time comes. Well, I don't know if I can say it until I know what the good fight is. What is the good fight? What is this narrow road that squeezes out all these second things so that the first thing becomes alive? And what is the life to which the narrow road leads? Is it the life of learning what it means to love, to put Jesus on display in any circumstance of life, in any condition of soul like we talked about last night, but again, what was, pardon this rambling here, but I just was thinking about this this morning quite a bit when I thought about the question. What do I want to say to the next generation, that's all of us really, but to the unique struggles of the younger generation? Um, what does it mean to have a profound thirst for God? What does it mean to have second things so eliminated from first thing status that nothing matters more to you than your thirst to know God and to make Him known in any circumstance of life. You know, I do a lot of public speaking, and um, as a former stutterer, it was very difficult to begin my speaking. And um, I don't, and I no longer have a fear of stuttering when I get up in front of people, but I certainly have my fears. Anybody completely over your fears? Because if you are, tell me how you get there, because I'm not. Um, but what would it mean for me to be able to get up behind this podium and to have the core energy of my soul being a thirst to please the Father, a thirst to represent Jesus well, and a thirst to live in the power of the Spirit, as opposed to a thirst to have you like my talk. That's the second thing. Nothing's wrong with hoping you like my talk. But you know the good news about this? When first things are in first place, if you hate my talk, you can't destroy me. Therefore, you have no power over me. So I don't care what you do. See? Now I'm free to say what I want to say, and I hope it blesses you, and I hope it encourages you, but I can't make that happen. That's the Spirit's job, so my job is to please the Father, to represent the Son, and to live in the power of the Spirit. That's the first thing kind of a life, which I wish it were entirely true of me. If we're going to develop the kind of thirst for God that's going to release us to love, then maybe there's a couple things, that I, one more thing I want to say about this before I get into the talk I prepared. Um... I thought this morning about a quote that I learned from Augustine some number of years ago, the great church father in the early centuries. Augustine came up with a parable that when I first heard it really struck me and it still strikes me to this day. Augustine said this, just imagine, imagine that God came to you. This is a first thing, second thing parable it seems to me. Suppose Augustine came to you and said, I suppose God came to you and said, <clears throat> I want you to write a list of everything you want, everything you're thirsty for, everything you desire. Write a list of everything that matters to you. Paul said, I want you to know what really matters. But God says, write out a list now of all the things that you want, all the blessings you pray for. By the way, most prayer in my mind in second thing Christians is not legitimate prayer, it's negotiation. I'll do this if you do that, God. We got a deal? That's how a lot of prayers work. Uh, but Augustine, Augustine said, imagine if God came to you and said, I want you to make a list of all the things in your life that you really would like to see happen. And um, when I first heard that, I thought, well, let me write things down. I'd like to be healthy. I'd like my marriage to be great. I'd like my kids to be godly. I'd like my ministry to succeed. I'd like my books to sell. I'd like a lot of things. I'd like to have good friends. I'd like to have a nice home. I'd like to have a decent income. I'd like to have all these things. None of those things are wrong to desire. But suppose God then came to you, Augustine says, and said to you, I will give you everything on your list on one condition. And the condition is that you will never see my face. 
Augustine concludes a parable by saying this, the chill that you feel in your soul when you anticipate never seeing the face of Christ is your love for God. And when I think like that, I find my demanding spirit weakening just a little bit. My demanding spirit of having Rachel treat me like I want to be treated at all times. I find my demanding spirit being something that I realize is a demand for second things that is not what really matters. And as I think about that, I start thinking more about what, um, what does it mean to be freed from a second thing life to become a first thing Christian who releases the divine nature that's within me so I can love other people the way I would like to be able to love. Well, that's my rambling introduction. <laughs> but let me get into what I want to think about today. What does it mean to, to think back on your life but to look ahead and and to live a life of love that Paul was encouraging Timothy to live when he was sitting in jail about to be executed. With that in my mind as a launch for what I want to say now, many of you, I would think, uh, know what it means to read a passage of Scripture that you've read a hundred times, and the hundred and first time it makes sense. Do you relate to that at all? Well, there's a particular... Holy Spirit moment, I would call it, that I'm going to talk about, not right away, but in a few minutes. But there's a particular moment when I believe the Spirit led me to look at a verse in Romans that we'll look at a little bit later. In Romans, that when I read it, I thought, I have no idea what it means, but I think it's important. I got to think about it. See, I don't think good exegesis takes place until you admit your confusion. And my approach to hermeneutics is read the Bible until you're confused, stop and start thinking. And I don't get by two or three verses before that gets required. But there's a verse that hit me probably about 20 years ago, but still has a real life within my soul. And I want to talk about that. But before I talk about that particular verse, I want to talk about another moment that I think the Spirit did something in my soul that I hadn't anticipated. And I even forget if I said this last night. If I did, just bear with the repetition. Um, but there's a, a gentleman in, in Australia, Dr. David Broughton Knox, who's... Um, looks like Einstein. He's a short guy, he's a Brit, and he has his wild white hair. And he was the principal of Moore Theological College in Australia. He was a brilliant man. He was considered by some to be the finest theological mind alive in his day. <clears throat> and I had the privilege of speaking at Moore Theological College and getting to know Dr. Knox. He was a very unusual, wonderfully unusual man. When I came back a second time, I hadn't seen him for five years, and I got off the plane, and my wife and I were picked up and driven to the seminary to greet, uh, be greeted by Dr. Knox, and then to go to our room to get over jet lag and go back and teach. And Dr. Knox, when he, <clears throat> when he met us again for the <clears throat> first time after five years, most people say what? How was your trip? <clears throat> Not Dr. Knox. He said, um, his opening sentence after meeting me again for after five years, he said, Larry, do you believe there's such a thing as ontology apart from relationality? <laughs> it's what I've been pondering on the flight the whole way over here. <clears throat> what he's saying, do you have any sense of your personhood <clears throat> without knowing what it means to release your personhood into relationality, into community? Can you be a person without loving? Can you be alive as an image bearer without being? Can you discover your essence as a human being, as an image bearer, the image bearer of the relational God without relating in community? And isolation destroys personhood. That's what he was saying. Well, he was a very strange man. <laughs> and he wrote one book called The Everlasting God. And in the appendix, did I say this last night? I don't think I did. In the appendix to um, his book, The Everlasting God, he he wrote a sentence that I read 20 years ago, thereabouts, that just rocked, my, rocked me off a little bit. He said, the central doctrine, this is going to be a bit of a review of last night, actually, the central doctrine of the Christian religion is, how would you finish that? The central doctrine, the central truth that must be guarded, the central truth as we look ahead and believe what's true, the central truth that undergirds everything about our lives, about the Christian religion is... And I remember stopping there before I read what turned the page to see what he was going to say, and I thought, what would I put in there? Well, I had a lot of options there. Substitutionary atonement, deity of Christ, the incarnation, the inerrancy of Scripture, all kinds of things matter deeply. But what he said was something I never would have thought of. 
And what he said, the central doctrine of the Christian life is a doctrine of the Trinity. And I went, huh, I don't think like that. Well, ever since then, I've been wanting to think like that. What is this doctrine of the Trinity? What is it, what is it so, why is it so important? There are certainly other essential truths, but what is the doctrine of the Trinity? And I would suggest that um, maybe we may quarrel a little bit as to whether that really is how you'd finish that sentence, but if we give Dr. Knox the benefit of the doubt and say if it's not the central doctrine, it certainly ranks very high up there, then what it fundamentally means is that you and I are relational beings because God is a relational being. As I said last night, the only small group that's not ever gotten along very well. And I believe that the doctrine of the Trinity um, opens up the idea of what the word love actually means, all that we said last night. And so for years now, I've been studying Trinitarian theology at my very lower level compared to the scholars that know things that I've never dreamed of. If you're interested in the doctrine of the Trinity in ways that you haven't thought about, let me give you a couple of books to read. Probably the first book that I'd recommend is a book by a British scholar named Michael Reeves, R-E-E-V-E-S, Michael Reeves, and the book is called Delighting in the Trinity. I was sitting at a Thanksgiving table a couple of years ago at our home, and I had a friend on this side, a young woman on this side, the daughter of a good friend of ours, and I was talking with him about this book called Delighting in the Trinity. This woman over here on this side said, what's the name of that book you're talking about? And I said, Delighting in the Trinity. She said, that's ridiculous. How do you delight in the Trinity? That's a silly sentence. And I said, well, uh, you yeah, know, I've got some thoughts on that. She said, I don't want to hear them. About a year later, she called me up and she said, what was that book again? And she's since gotten married, and I think is moving in a direction to be delighted, maybe a little bit in the Trinity. Um, another book that I recommend is the second one. These are two primer books, short books. Daryl Johnson, professor at Houston, at, um, was a professor at Regent College in Vancouver, a marvelous man. He wrote a book called Experiencing the Trinity. And in that particular book, I was very, very drawn because he he said in the opening pages of the book that when he got a hold of one of the Torrance brothers from Scotland, who was well known as a Trinitarian theologian, and he realized that the Trinity is not a closed community, but they've opened themselves, wanting other people to join the dance of relational love. When he got a hold of that, Daryl John said, I didn't know whether to fall on my knees and weep for joy or to stand up and do a dance. I got so excited about it, and I said, I'd like to meet this guy, because he seems to know the Trinity in a way that I don't. Well, I got an invitation some years ago to speak at Regent College at the pastor's conference, and the letter came from, from Daryl Johnson. So I got all excited and called him up and said, Daryl, I'd love to come to Regent and accept your invitation, but I have one condition. And I'm sure he assumed I was going to say, here's my fee that I require. And I didn't say that. And I said, the only condition I have is I'll, I'll come only if you're there. I want to meet you. And he said, I'm the moderator of the conference. And I said, wonderful. Uh, so I went and um, I was very surprised at the way he handled himself. When I would speak at this pastor's conference, there were three speakers, I was one of three, and he did the same thing after each speaker. I would give my talk, I gave several talks, I would give my talk, and then I would sit down, and Daryl Johnson, the moderator, would get up. <laughs> and some of you who publicly speak know what happens when the moderator gets up after you speak. They get up and say, well, thank you, Dr. Crabb, I really appreciate that message, and I think what Dr. Crabb was trying to say, then they give their own little talk. And you feel like, well, what'd you invite me for? You know, if you want to give your own talk, just give a talk. I'll sit in the audience. I don't care. Um, but Daryl didn't do that. He would get up after each of us spoke. I'll just talk about after my speaking. He'd get up and he would stand there. I would close in prayer. I would sit down. Daryl would get up and he would stand there. And he would literally just close his eyes and stand there for about a minute. That's four seconds. Can you imagine what a minute would be like? I remember sitting there the first time he did it thinking, um, do you have a headache? Um, I mean, what is, what is going on? And I had no idea, but I discovered later as we chatted and some other folks made known to me what he was like. You know what he was doing? He was eavesdropping on the Trinity. You ever eavesdrop on people? It's dangerous unless it's a Trinity. Sometimes when I speak in groups like this, large groups, People come up and say to me, oh, Dr. Crabb, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. And I want to know what they really meant. So sometimes, I've done this actually, I go into the <clears throat> men's room and I sit in a stall and listen. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it's happened that a voice that just earlier said, wonderful message, praise the Lord, I hear the same voice saying, what's he talking about? I'm so confused, you know, and it's, it's just dangerous to eavesdrop, but not with the Trinity. 
Daryl would sit there and wonder, well, what's happening among the relationships in the Trinity now? What is the Father, what is the Father glad that was represented this, by, by our brother, Dr. Crabb? What, what has exalted Jesus? And Jesus said, yes, to, I, I, I want the glory. I deserve the glory because my glory being received by others transforms them. What is the spirit delighted about that Dr. Crabb didn't quench? And as he was thinking like that, then after about a minute, literally, he would say, I believe what was underlined in my soul as I listened to our brother speak. And then he would say things that were just central to everything I had in my mind. He wrote the book, Experience in the Trinity. If you want to get a hold of that kind of thing, I'd strongly recommend it. Because if you really get a grasp of the relationality of ultimate existence, meaning that ultimate reality is not propositional, ultimate reality is passionate, and propositional truth is crucial because it leads, to, it leads you to what is most deeply passionate about your soul as a lover. What did I just say? That was a big sentence. <laughs> no idea what I said, but it's, maybe it's important, I don't know. But once you get a hold of some of this, the mystery of the Trinity, then you begin to realize that love really matters. And something that struck me that I noticed about a year or so ago, when the Lord in, the, in Matthew 28 gave the Great Commission, He, he said, um, as you, as you pro pro proclaim the gospel to all nations, what I want you to do with the new disciples, I want you to teach them. And He doesn't say what I would have thought He would have said. He doesn't say, teach them to believe all that I've taught. He doesn't say that. He says, teach them to obey all my commands. Why is that different? And when you realize he said, teach them to obey all my commands, then your mind gets intrigued by wondering, well, what commands did Jesus give? And so one scholar who I've read, he looked through all the four Gospels, and he found that there are 10 times that's recorded that Jesus gives the word command or commandments. And every of those, of those 10 times where Jesus used the word command, this is my command that you love one another, 10 times that he's used the word command or commandments, and seven of them explicitly talk about love, the other three imply it. In other words, Jesus is saying, when you're talking to new believers or to any believers, make sure that what matters most, Paul in Philippians 1, what really matters most is that you learn what it means to love like the Trinity, and you don't have a vision of what love is until you understand a little bit about how the Trinity relates. This book, I brought up the book that I most recently wrote because I want to read something from David Broughton Knox, that man from Australia. It's a bit of a lengthy quote, but listen to this brilliant man talking about the importance of the Trinity. Bestsellers today reflect the modern ideal of expressing yourself, of loving yourself, of liberating yourself from your relationships with other people, which constrict the development of your own personality. Be a tick on the dog, require your spouse to treat you in a certain way or find some other spouse. Through the revelation of the Trinity, believers can see that this particular philosophical concept and social objective is contrary to reality and therefore will not bring the hoped for benefits of happiness and peace. And then I italicize this next lengthy sentence or two. A renewal of understanding of the Trinity and its implications for the way human life should be based will lead to the recognition that personal relationships which are other person-centered are ultimate in value for living, even though it should turn out that in serving those relationships, it becomes impossible to pursue the chimera of gracious living, the balanced life, and so-called authentic existence. Even life itself may be lost, but eternity will vindicate the reality of the basis of such actions. Did you get all that? I don't either. But the idea is if you believe in the Trinity, then you learn that love is costly, but in eternity you'll have no regrets. Now, as I think about all that, I get very bothered. And this is what I want to get to now. I get very bothered by the fact that the more I study Trinitarian theology, the more I sometimes feel discouraged. Because I fall short every day, as I indicated last night. But the question that I want to address for the rest of my time this morning is, why do I fall so far short? Once you start grasping what it means to love like the Trinity, to put Jesus on display by how you relate to other people, preface this thought real quickly. You, you, know the, you know one of the real keys to loving in a very practical sense is the art of curiosity. It's the lost art of the Christian community. 
How many times have you said, just casually to a friend, I saw a good movie last night, and your friend says, I saw one too, as opposed to, what did you see? How rare it is to be curious because I want to say something that comes from me as opposed to have any profound interest in you. When I teach spiritual direction, when I teach counseling, I argue with, with, with my students that if you don't learn the art of curiosity, you will fail because you'll never know the other person. The great tragedy in the Christian life is the tragedy of an unobserved life. What does it mean to be curious? Why do I tend not to be curious? Why do I tend to be there for me? Why do I tend to fall so far, to, so far short of the relational glory of God? Well, I want to give one answer to that question, and it has to do with looking ahead to what is coming. And I want to read you this passage that I've read a hundred times, but some years ago it jumped out to me in a brand new way. And let me read a context for this passage. It's Romans chapter 7. Paul is saying this starting in verse 5, when we were controlled by our old nature, remember to talk last night, what's our old nature? It ultimately is defined by a commitment to my well-being at any cost to you. Heck with you, it's all about me. Straighten up, will you? When we were controlled by our old nature, sinful desires were at work within us. Sinful desires. Is he talking just about pornography? Is he talking just about adultery? Is he talking just about gluttony? Is he just talking about uh, materialism? Or is he talking about a commitment to my well-being at any expense to you? Sinful desires were at work within us, and the law aroused those evil desires that produced a harvest of sinful deeds resulting in death. But now, but now we've been released from the law, for we died to it and are no longer captive to its power. And now here's the verse that jumped out at me. Now we can serve God, not in the old way of obeying the letter of the law, but in the new way of living in the Spirit. When I read that some years ago, I thought, what's he talking about? That verse is what led me to write the book, The Pressure's Off. What is this old way? What is this new way? What is the old way to live that is obeying the letter of the law? Well, wait a minute, isn't obedience important? Is the old way just being obedient? Wait a minute, that's a good thing in the Christian life. It can't be that God is not, not is saying, well, don't be obedient. That's not what he's saying. So what is the old way? And why is that put aside? And what is this new way? What is, he, what is the new way of living in the Spirit? Now, I've always been a little scared of the Spirit. I was raised in a very, very conservative background. I was raised in the holy duet. The Father, Son, and watch out for the Charismatics. That was my background. <laughs> I was teaching in England some years ago, and the Pentecostal brother, a very wonderful brother, um, was the host of this conference. 500 Brits were there for a week, and I was lecturing from 9 to 5 every day. And when the meeting was over, when the, the week was over, I had dinner with um, Selwyn Hughes was his name, a marvelous man. He's with the Lord now, a Pentecostal brother. And um, in the course of our conversation, I, I said to him, after the whole meeting was over, I said, um, Selwyn, any feedback for me? I'd just like to hear whatever you might have to say to me. And uh, he said, well, I wasn't going to offer my feedback unless you requested it. And I thought, I'm out of here. Um, <laughs> but he said to me, um, he said, Larry, I noticed in the course of your talking for seven or eight hours, six, seven hours every day for five days, that perhaps it's my Pentecostalism that is showing here, Larry, but um, I sensed a time and then I noticed a second time and I ended up noticing seven times in the course of the week that the Holy Spirit descended palpably on the group. And I could feel the Spirit was doing a mighty work in the room. And each time that the Holy Spirit descended on the room in palpable presence, you told a joke. And I went, um, what's your point? <laughs> and he said, oh, Larry, why are you afraid of the Holy Spirit? Why, when he takes over, must you regain control? Why must you get people back with you? Why do you sometimes use humor for inappropriate purposes? And when he said, Larry, you're afraid of the Holy Spirit, I just was smitten. And I thought, I believe in the Holy Trinity, not the Holy Duet. And I want to know what it means to live in the new way of the Spirit. 
Let me deal with three passages briefly to give you some understanding, at least my understanding, of what I think Paul is talking about when he says, let's, live the old, let's not live the old way of the law because you can't love under that, but the new way of the Spirit, which releases you to love. Three passages from Scripture that when you put them all together that we're going to look at briefly, make the main point that I want to leave you with in this presentation, and that point can be put this way. Here's my central point. When the anticipation of heaven is rendered insignificant in comparison with our longing for a better life now, can you hear that? When the anticipation of heaven, the day is coming, when the anticipation of heaven is rendered secondary, insignificant in comparison with the thirst that we have, with the longing for a better life now, it becomes difficult, if not impossible, to love others well during our time on earth. Let me say it a little more cumbersomely, if that's possible. Release the hope of heaven. No, no, no. Replace the hope of heaven with a stronger hope for a better life now. What are you thirsty for? Replace the hope of heaven with a stronger hope for a better life now, and you feed your already alive spirit of entitlement. I think the essence of sin is an entitled spirit. Replace the hope of heaven with a stronger hope for a better life now, and you feed your already alive spirit of entitlement, and the effect is to transform your prayer life into a negotiation with God. I'll do this and you do that. It's the old way of the letter of the law. And the power of the flesh, which consists of the passion for one's own felt, one's own felt well-being above all other goods, overwhelms the passion of your new heart to release divine love from your soul into another. I know it's difficult to hear a long sentence read like that. I hope you hear some of the point of it. Let me see if I can make a little sense out of those cumbersome sentences. In John 16, beginning in 14 and 15, but all the way up through John 16, Jesus says some things rather interestingly. Essentially says this, if you look at the whole passage, He says, I to his disciples before he's going to go to die, he said, I want you to know three things. One, the world's going to hate you. You're going to fail big time, and I'm taking off. <laughs> Be of good cheer. Because <laughs> I've overcome the world. Not with my eyesight, you haven't. Ah, you forgot the larger story, Larry? Yeah. Well, that will make no sense to you until you see the story that I'm telling that began in eternity past and continues to eternity future. And if you don't have an understanding of the culmination, the consummation of the larger story, then the fact that the world's going to hate you and you're going to screw up royally a lot of times and you're not going to feel my presence the way you long to and could feel only if I were there physically with you, which I will not be until heaven again, in the middle of all those struggles, I want you to realize that the victory has already been won and it's going to be realized only when you get to heaven and until you have that as your central first thing hope, you're going to be living for a better life now and that means you're not going to be able to love. See, following Jesus, counting the cost to be his disciple, means you no longer make it your first thing to manage your life so that it works well. You rather live like Jesus, who was loved by a few and ignored and hated by many. As we said last night in 1 Corinthians 15, 19, if our hope in Christ is only for life in this world, to be pleasantly blessed. Are you living for blessings? If your hope in Christ is only for life in this world to be pleasantly blessed with good health, good money, good marriage, good kids, good friends, good ministry, whatever, and protected, if your hope is to be protected from bad things happening, if that's your only hope, you don't have a chance to love well at all. Listen to what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 30, 32. Why do you think, Paul said, this, from the, this is for the message, why do you think I keep risking my neck in this dangerous work? I look death in the face practically every day I live. Do you think I do this 
If I wasn't convinced of your resurrection and mine as guaranteed by the resurrected Messiah Jesus, do you think I was just trying to act heroic when I fought the wild beast of Ephesus, knowing, of, knowing, hoping it wouldn't be the end of me? Not on your life. It's resurrection. It's resurrection, always resurrection that undergirds what I do and the way and say the way I live. And if there's no resurrection, we might as well eat, drink, and the next day we die because that's all there is to it. If you don't have heaven as your ultimate hope, you're living for a better life now and it's going to destroy your ability to love. See, there's a very strange verse in Deuteronomy 29.9, which we so easily misinterpret. I certainly do. God, speaking through Moses, said this in Deuteronomy 29.9, if you carefully follow the terms of this covenant, everything you do will prosper. Oh, I see. Get it right and life will work. Well, when our two sons were born 48 and 46 years ago, I was determined to be the best father the world has ever seen because I don't want my kids to mess up. I wanted my kids to be godly. I wanted my kids to love Jesus. Can you bear with me if I say that's the second thing? What do you do if your children are not walking with the Lord? Does that destroy your soul? It hurts your soul deeply, but it can't destroy what's indestructible within you. If your first thing is to have godly kids, you're going to make a mess of being a parent. <laughs> I was being interviewed by Jim Dobson one time without my father some years ago, and in the middle of an interview, Jim Dobson, a very skilled interviewer, um, popped a question I hadn't anticipated, and he said, Larry, what would you say to parents of a newborn child? And he had his feet up on the desk, very casual, and we're on radio, you know, and I hadn't expected the question, so my immediate impulsive reaction, which I would defend, actually, what do you think, what do you think, Larry, you'd say to the parents of a newborn child? And I would say, don't make it your goal to raise a godly kid. And Jim's feet came off the table. <laughs> and he looked at me and he says, but I want my kids to be godly. And I said, me too, but I can't control it. All I can do is, is love them and discipline them and do all the things that fathers should do, but for the pleasure of the Father to put Jesus on display and leave the results up to Jesus and up to the Spirit. But that isn't how I thought when my kids were born. I wanted my kids to be godly, so I was living in the old way of the letter of the law. I was going to get it right so life would work. If I carefully follow the terms of this covenant, if I carefully do what I'm supposed to do, the blessings will come my way and everything will work. When our kids were little, we had family devotions as very few families have devotions. For family devotions, this goes back some years, obviously, I purchased an overhead projector. <laughs> we did Old Testament survey, New Testament survey. By the time my kids were five years old, they could define propitiation. <laughs> How many kids do you know who can define propitiation who, who had struggles later on? Well, I can name two. My two sons, who I'm so grateful now, are both walking with the Lord. But I'll tell you this, when our older son, and I say this with permission, I would never tell personal stories without permission, our older son, who now works for me in my ministry, he's 48 years old. When he was 15, and I was a professor at a seminary, he rebelled very badly. And he got himself in lots of trouble. He went to Taylor University. He got kicked out of Taylor for reasons I'd have kicked him out if I'd have been the dean. You know Taylor University? It's in the boondocks of Indiana. Chuck Colson once said, send your kids to Taylor. It's 50 miles from the nearest sin. <laughs> Perhaps it was until my son got there. <laughs> and when he rebelled and broke my heart and broke Rachel's heart, and it was so difficult because when second things don't go right, it hurts. Not like hell, but it hurts like near hell. And when our son rebelled so badly, I can't tell you the number of times I would walk through Warsaw, Indiana, where we were living, where Grace Seminary is, where I was a professor. I would walk the streets of Indiana late at night, two in the morning sometimes, and I'd be screaming at God, and I would say, what more did you want me to do? I was the coach of their ball teams. I taught them the Bible. I prayed with them every night. I realized something Lewis said, that people, children, learn more from their heroes by example than their teachers who proclaim. And I thought, all right, who are my kids' heroes? 
And I began to notice the television programs they were watching, and back in that day, they were both enamored with the Incredible Hulk. And I would watch the Incredible Hulk saying, what lessons are being learned from this hero, this idiot fig figure of this television show? And I noticed something really obvious. The Incredible Hulk never prayed. <laughs> so the lesson is, Prayer isn't important to getting your life together in some way and to become powerful and incredible and all that sort of thing. And I thought, they're learning terrible lessons from the Hulk, and I'm trying to defeat him by having devotions every night. That's so why I made up a hero for them called Captain L. Scabbard. And he was a crime fighter, but he was a Christian. And he would get his team together, Tony Cannon, the soccer champion, Archie Kramer, the world-class boxer, William Lemuel Periwinkle III, the English professor. And the four of these guys would fight Baron Conrad de Moon, de Moon, de Moon you know. And, um, and they would pray about it. They would get together and they would pray. And they would talk about, we're doing this for the glory of God. But they weren't making a big deal about it, but it was assumed. The lessons your heroes assume are the ones that are grasped by people. And I did all that, and I, I wrote two novels that Moody Press published on Captain Al Scabbard. And I thought, man, am I a good dad, God, you owe me. Do you see? That's the old way. Get it right and life works, and you better cooperate, God. Now, you don't say that out loud because we're Christians, but that's what happens in our souls. It's not good. The law wasn't given centrally for us to obey. It was given to expose the fact that we can't. It's a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, to show people their sins, Galatians 3.19. Why then was the law given? It was given alongside the promise, the promise of a prosperous, pleasant life, to show people their sins. You can't get it right. God gives two grades on His test, 100 or zero. None of us get 100, so we all get zero. We're unworthy of God's blessings, and we think we're worthy because we've taught our kids the Bible with an overhead projector. How ridiculous, and that's how I lived for years. Until I read Romans 7, 6. And I realized that the law of linearity does not define the Christian life. The law of linearity, a straight line, if I do A, B will take place. It doesn't work that way. The fact that I have a good marriage has everything to do with the Spirit of God, not with the fact that I've been a successful husband. The fact that both of my kids are walking with the Lord right now, and I'm so grateful for that, both of my kids, my adult sons, I couldn't tell you how grateful I am. But if I understand the new way of the Spirit, I don't feel proud, I feel grateful. There's a huge difference in the two. And when my kids were not walking with the Lord, my younger son did fairly well, although um, he went through some great difficulties. It was hard, but if you live the old way of the Spirit, you feel like a failure. If you owe oh, the old way of the, the written law, if you live the old way, you feel like a failure when things don't work and you begin to hate yourself. If you live the new way of the Spirit, which I'll define in just a moment, if you live the new way of the Spirit, then your heart breaks over children that break your heart, but it's a second thing. And your hurt doesn't define you. It disturbs you deeply, but it doesn't define you. And when your kids do well, you're thrilled and grateful, but you're not proud, and you don't feel now you have every right to go teach everybody else how to be good parents because your kids turned out so well. I was leading a week-long seminar when the phone call came from my wife that our older son had been kicked out of Taylor. Right in the middle of a week-long seminar, I was teaching to about 300 people. And the next day, I was scheduled to give a three-hour talk on parenting. <laughs> I couldn't get a plane out of there fast enough to <laughs> miss the talk. I gave the talk. And I believe, this is not false modesty, I, I believe that the talk that I gave on parenting that next morning was the first humble talk I've ever given on parenting. Because the old way was being squeezed out of me on the narrow road. The law of linearity must give way to the law of liberty. Hebrews 7, 18 and 19, the former regulation is set aside. The old way no longer is operative. The former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless. 
because the law made nothing perfect because we can't keep the law. That's the whole point of the Lord giving the law to show us we can't keep it. We need salvation that's only available in the one who kept the law perfectly and died the death of people who break the law. The form of regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless for the law made nothing perfect. And here's the last thought I want to give you. And a better life is introduced. A better hope, I'm sorry. A better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. So my question, do you want a better life or do you want a better hope? If you want a better life, godly kids, great marriage, good health, good ministry, decent bank account, all kinds of wonderful things, of course you want that. Nothing's wrong with wanting blessings because God has given us richly all things to enjoy. There's a verse for that. But he says, make sure that you don't, those of you who are wealthy, don't put your hope in uncertain riches, but make sure your hope is on God, who does give you many things to enjoy. And when he gives you a wonderful wife like I have, I think it's right to enjoy her. When I have two kids that come, have come back to the Lord and are walking with Jesus, I think it's right to enjoy them. I think it's wonderful. But I can't place my hope on that, and I can't say, that is, that is what I'm after, the better life of having a wonderful wife and godly kids and a decent ministry. I love those blessings, but do you realize blessings are dangerous because you're going to start thinking you deserved it, you start thinking you're going to live for it, you start thinking that's what life is all about, and when you think like that, you're walking the broad road to a wasted life because you're not going to love. You're going to manipulate people and God, and God is not manipulable. The former regulation, get it right and life works, set aside. Notice a few things about that verse from Hebrews 7, 18, and 19. What was set aside? Well, if you look at the context carefully, it's the Levitical priesthood, which dealt with uh, lawbreakers. But verse 12 says in Hebrews 7, for when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. In other words, what's been set aside the Mosaic law, which if kept perfectly, guaranteed law keepers a blessed life, that's been set aside because it cannot work because you can't keep the law perfectly. So dump the old way of proud obedience to get God to cooperate with the script of your smaller story. That's the first thing I hear. But then the second thing, a better hope is introduced. What is it? Now here's the problem. If we're not in touch with our deepest thirst, the promise of a better hope will not stir us very much. John 17, 3, Jesus said, the way to real life, life that lasts, this is life, he said, talking to his father in his high priestly prayer. John 17, this is life, that you have a great marriage. This is life that you have godly kids. This is life that you have good friends. This is life that you get over your sin problem. This is life that you know God and Jesus Christ, a knowledge that only comes through the Spirit opening our eyes to hear the gospel as revealed in Scripture. We too easily define life as a life full of earthly blessings. Very quickly, just a quick little story here. Time is getting close. I want you to think back on your life. I mentioned this last night briefly, but I want to develop it a little bit more. Think back on your time in a life when something happened that made you feel terrific, legitimately terrific. Nothing's wrong with the blessings that make you feel good, and I'm all for them. But when you have a blessing that comes into your life that makes you feel really good, the world, the flesh, and the devil, the unholy trinity, is at work. And you begin to think that that blessing that felt so good is the definition of life. Illustration. When I was in graduate school, my third year of the five-year program in clinical psych, I had a professor named Dr. Ullman, who was a very prominent psychologist, had written a number of books on psychopathology, and the class was psychopathology in my third year. And Dr. Ullman had required all of the students in his small class, he only took a limited number of students, there were 30 of us, we had to write a major paper on the class. And... Um, it was time for him to give the papers back. Now listen to this story and realize that you might think I'm bragging, I'm actually repenting. He had graded the papers that we had all turned in, and he wasn't a very relational kind of a guy. He didn't know our names at all after a long time being in class, and he would look at the test paper that he had graded. He would say, Sally Smith, which one is? Oh, okay, here we are. Uh, Bill so-and-so, here we are. Joe so-and-so, he'd give the paper out. And then halfway through, he'd say, Larry Crabb, and I raised my hand, and he walked over. And he stopped as he handed me the paper. Listen to what he said. You'll think I'm bragging. 
Stay with me. Dr. Ullman said, this is the finest paper I've ever graded in my history as a graduate professor. How did I feel? <laughs> you feel so good. You define life wrong. Life defined by that experience, putting me on display, getting kudos, and that's life. And I've been challenged by the Spirit of God more times than I can count to ask the question, so why do I write books? Why do I tremble when I see my first review? Why when it's negative do I get ticked? And why when it's positive do I feel, well, it's about time? Am I living the old way? You better believe it. That's, that's in me still, just like it's in you. But I long to live the new way of the Spirit. I long to live the new way of the Spirit of the Father-Son relationship, which is the love of that relationship. And the Spirit is within me. And when I realize that the Spirit that is within me is nudging me to say, Larry, the first thing in your life is Jesus Christ and putting Him on display by the way you love other people, by the way you move into their lives, by the way you're curious about their story, by the way you want to bring the gospel to bear in their lives. When you realize that's the first thing, Larry, it's going to change the way you treat your wife. You're not going to treat your wife manipulatively, trying to get her to respond to you the way you want to be responded to, but you're going to want to be pouring something into, your, into her, her soul in a way that's going to bless her. I said last night that I'd be calling my wife and that she tends to like to chat quite a bit when I talk, and I wanted to go to bed, and she wanted to chat quite a bit when I wanted to go to bed. And because of what I had taught last night, I was more aware of what I was thinking, and I kept asking questions, and we went on for a long time. And uh, it felt like a holy moment in my life. And the problem is when, like I said the other day, when you feel like you're doing something right, you can start getting proud, as opposed to saying, Lord, that would never have happened without my knowledge of who you are. Praise the Lord. To God be the glory, as opposed to, Larry, you pulled it off. You're a wonderful guy. That's the old way. So here's the point of all that I'm trying to make this morning. Paul fought the good fight of walking that narrow road. Paul fought the good fight of putting Christ on display. But he couldn't have done it without realizing that he could say at the end of his life, I fought the good fight, Timothy, and I'm going to die, and I have no regrets. Here's what I said at the opening of this talk. When the anticipation of heaven is rendered insignificant in comparison with our longing for a better life now, it becomes difficult, if not impossible, to love others well during our time on earth. If I'm living to make my life better now, if that's my first thing, I will not be willing to sacrifice and suffer in order to love you. And here's the second way that I said it. Replace the hope of heaven with a stronger hope for a better life now, the old way, and you feed your already alive spirit of entitlement. And the effect is to transform your prayer life into negotiation with God. I'll do this if you do that. I'll teach my kids the Bible. You keep them straightened out. And the power of the flesh, which consists of the passion for one's own felt well-being above any other good, overwhelms the passion of the new heart to release divine love from your soul into another. The old way, get it right, life will work. The new way of the Spirit, discover the joy of abiding in Christ and fellowshipping with the Father by longing to honor the passionate commitment of your Spirit-alive heart. The new way of the Spirit. Are you thirsty? What are you thirsty for? My last sentence, we're close to it. Your thirst for God will sustain you more than your experience of God. Because God doesn't give us a palpable sense of His experience 24-7. And there's times when I long to experience His presence and I don't. Screw tape got very concerned in the screw tape letters, the senior demon talking to Wormwood, the junior. When screw tape said to the junior demon who was working on his patient, you know, he said, Our enemy, referring to God, seems to delight in removing any sense of his presence from his followers. And when, they, when the sense of his presence has vanished from their awareness, 
when they still remain faithful, he seems to enjoy that the most. And our research department can't figure that out. There are so many times I don't experience God's presence when I long for it. But I long for it. And that's the thirst that sustains you. That's the mark of the Christian. The mark that defined Christ as He hung on the cross. Sacrificing intimacy with the Father. Suffering the cruelty of very bad people. And the onslaught of the devil in order to invite us to join the dance of the Trinity. Now that's love. And that's what I'm called to live. But I won't do it if I live the old way of the Spirit. The old way of the flesh. But I will learn a little bit more about love when I grasp what it means to live the new way of the Spirit. Father, what you're up to isn't what we thought you were up to sometimes. We thought you were going to heal us from our diseases. We thought you were going to straighten out our marriages, and sometimes you don't. We thought you were going to bless our ministry, and sometimes it collapses. And Father, help us to realize that when we sing, Great is Thy Faithfulness, we're singing that you're faithful to your purposes, not to ours. And that we can't sing, Great is Thy Faithfulness, to anybody but you. But as we sing it to you, Father, teach us that we're singing a deep truth that needs to be guarded, the truth that sustained Paul even as he went to his death. That the purpose you had was not to give him a long life. The purpose you had was to give him the power to love like Jesus, to live in the new way of the Spirit. Thank you that that's what you're committed to and help us to realize that it does take a narrow road to walk, but it's going to lead to that life, the life of knowing Christ by fellowshipping with him as we display him in the way we relate to others. I offer all this in Christ's name. Amen.